Hi. Hi. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainability Living channel. We've got two guests with us today, Hamish uh, from um, Sheffield, who Hello. has an uh, um, aquaponics set up in his back garden and is also working on some clever bits of equipment, which I'm sure he'll talk to us about. And um, he works at Sheffield University where there is another set up. And Tim? Hi. <laughs> down in Wales doing his bit and uh, researching lots of things to do with uh, sustainability particularly related to the economy. So maybe we should start with you Hamish. What is it you've got there in that lovely greenhouse of yours? Well here we've got an aquaponics system which is all about growing fish and vegetables in a closed loop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to hydroponics which is about growing vegetables in water. But unlike hydroponics, we don't need fertilizers. Fertilizers are an increasingly scarce resource. So in this case, what we're doing is we're replacing the fertilizers with the fish who live in a tank in the back over there. And they go about their normal fishy business, and they poo in the water, and they respire. And that process creates ammonia. And then in these media beds, which you can see over here, we have some clay bowls. Can you see those? Yeah, you can see them. Yeah. And they're very good for bacteria to live on. And we have a bunch of beneficial bacteria that take the ammonia from the fish and they turn it into plant food. They turn it into nitrites and then nitrates. And the plants suck the nitrates out of the water, cleans the water, feeds the plants, and all clean water goes back to the fish over there, and everybody's happy. So we've basically got intensive agriculture without fertilizers. You've got quite a lovely setup there, Hamish. What kind of fish are you growing? We can go and have a look if you like. Mm. So in aquaponics, usually, we can grow lots of different types of fish. And uh, if you like eating fish, then quite a lot of people harvest them. But in this case, We've got fish here just for a demonstration system, so we've got goldfish. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll, when I open the lid here, they'll probably start thinking they're about to be fed. Hey. Can you see them down there? You can, mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing. Hungry goldfish. And it's not feeding time yet. Excellent. I'm just going to turn the air pump and the water pump off just for a little while. It'll make it a little bit quieter and I can hear what you're what you're saying. Lovely. Have you got have you got um, goldfish at um, the university as well, Hamish? Perfect. Is it Hello? still what, sorry? Have you got goldfish at the university set up as well? Uh, yes it is, yeah. So we, this is the one that we built first in mm -hmm. my back garden, uh, and now we've built one down at the university, and we've also got a little one in the uh, winter gardens in the centre of Sheffield. All right. Um, so if you're in Sheffield, pop down to the winter gardens, <laughs> have a look for a couple of trestle tables with some goldfish sitting there in the middle. Uh, we've got a setup where children can colour in a fish and. They can propose a name for one of our goldfish. We've got a little competition running and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's all part of spreading the message about sustainable food and aquaponics and all the rest of it. Fantastic. You know a lot about because you're thinking you're doing the same, I believe. I am. Yes, very much so. Yes, like we've um, well, I'm planning to start set up like yourself a, a smallish version at home to trial it out and make sure I can get it right. I'm particularly interested in in how to power it off grid as well. Are, are you doing that there, or, you, or have you got it hooked in through your home? We've got all this running on mains electricity from my house. You can just see the uh, I don't know if you can see the board down here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're trying to achieve is to figure out how much money it costs to grow food like this. Mm. Um, mm. So we're metering the amount of electricity that we need for the pumps. Mm -hmm. We've got a water pump, obviously, also an air pump to put lots of oxygen into the water. Mm -hmm. And 
over time we're recording that data, also using some electronics called a water elf, which measures things like temperature and uh, pH levels in the water, which fish are sensitive to, and so on. Mm -hmm. And after, after a while, collect it all to be able to say, well, if you invest this amount of money, uh, you can grow this amount of food, and this, uh, and make a direct comparison with the kind of costs that you have for a shopping basket in Tesco's or Waitrose or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I think that's quite important for people, isn't it? Because if you're going to invest not just the money but your time as well, you, you have to sow the plants and, and pick them and things as well, don't you? That's right. It's uh, the, the, These are tough questions for people to answer right now and tough decisions for people to make. You know, If you want to do one of these, how much it's going to cost, uh, what you're going to get in return. So we really want to try and increase the amount of knowledge we have about doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People in places like Australia, uh, the US to an extent, have done a lot of these systems, so they know that some of those answers already. Um, but generally they're doing it in a different climate to the one that we have here. So mm -hmm. really we want to be able to say, you know, if you're in Sheffield and it's the middle of winter, what am I going to grow? Uh, what things grow successfully under these conditions? Do I need to add some artificial heat, some light, and how much is that going to cost? Yes. And hopefully yeah. that'll make it easier for people to make decisions about doing it for themselves. Yes, it's been a, um, um, some exciting uh, events taking place in the Netherlands, haven't they? They've managed to get a sustainability town or the rights to build a sustainability town, which is quite tough in Britain to get the agreements from higher up to to be able to do it big scale. But if we can do it, if Individuals can do it at home. You know, there's nothing really to stop you apart from your own desire and pocket, I guess. That's right. I mean, it's, it'll be lovely, and I think it's going to happen when people start developing these systems on a community scale. Mm. You know, that's what we really need. Every little community to take their bit of Oops. food on it. But that's a very big step to take at the moment. Um, and people don't, you know, the knowledge about how to do that and about how to use intensive technology like this uh, is very thinly spread, at least in the UK. Yes. So the hope is that taking a system like this, which, you know, all the materials all in inside that greenhouse cost about a thousand pounds. Some of it's second hand and recycled. Mm -hmm. This is a recycled uh, IBC container, which yeah. you can pick up for 40 quid, um, each one of these. We take three of those and cut two of them up to make these media beds, and then one, the one, there's one whole one for the fish over there. Mm -hmm. So it's not too expensive. It's not beyond the scope of a kind of back garden grower. Mm -hmm. And we hope that if we can push out more of these systems to more people and spread the knowledge around a bit, then that will encourage people to start working on a community level and start making urban farms, community farms, and start growing more food uh, that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's a matter of, of taking the, making it a little bit more energy efficient and a little bit more water efficient, isn't it, as well as not using the fertilizers. That's right. Aquaponics is a, a recirculating aquaculture system. So we don't flush any water away. Very often in hydroponics, we actually have to get rid of the water because things get gummed up and chemicals start to build up and so on. But we, we can't do that in aquaponics. We're all about recirculating the water. So it's very uh, sustainable from a water point of view. It's also that also makes it good for places where uh, you have arid environments uh, and people are running out of water. Mm. It also means that we don't have to use soil because we use these uh, these media beds, um, and uh, that makes it applicable in all sorts of urban spaces. You know doesn't have to be a greenhouse, it can be one with the university is in a little alcove that used to be used by smokers. Apologies to the smoking community, we've deprived them of one of their, their few remaining spaces, but the point is to try and put intensive food production into all sorts of little urban niches and so on. So is that, does that have light in that one then? Um, it has, we've put some plastic sheets across the front so uh, let me just ask Gareth to maybe move somewhere a bit quieter. Um, we've put plastic sheets across the front, so it gets some light, but it's partly shaded by surrounding buildings. 
All right. It's actually quite a realistic test of what kinds of environments, what kind of light you get in those urban environments. Yes. And again, we'll measure all this stuff, collect the data over time, and then we'll be able to say, well, you know, if you do this uh, in this kind of setting, here's, here's what the economics are. Mm -hmm. My plan at, uh, um, well, we're about to move, so I haven't, that's why I haven't set it up as yet, but where I am at the moment, if I don't move too far away, <laughs> um, I've got a, a little shed which I was planning to put the fish into and the greenhouse to grow the plants in. And my plan was to run uh, the pipework under the ground and put, um, uh, I think they're called culture or something like, set up in, in between to warm the water a bit for them so that um, it keeps them warm during the winter. That sounds like a really good idea because um, uh, the plants are more flexible in terms of temperature and so on, but they need light. The fish typically like being in kind of enclosed spaces. They don't like being uh, having having open space above them because that's where most of the predators come from. Mm. Uh, so putting the fish in a nice warm indoor environment and piping the water out through the plants is possible, I think. Yes, I'm hoping so. Yeah, um, uh, I'll need to have a fairly hefty um, solar panel, I suspect, to run a pump. Uh, big enough to st for that kind of a setup, because although it might come cooler to warmer through the the um, warming media in the middle, I suspect it'll still need a fairly hefty pump to keep it all running round. Yeah, it might do. Yeah, good. I guess it depends how big the setup is too. I'd like to be able to make the maximum use of the greenhouse and have it really full. Right. Yeah. And it's probably not as big as yours. I've got a dinky one, six foot square. Yeah, we, that's one of the objectives of our development program that we, we're looking for crowdfunding for in September, mm -hmm. is to shrink these a little bit. Because this is, um, I think it's 8 by 12. Mm -hmm. 4, 6, 8, yeah, 8 foot by 12 foot. Uh, and it just fits these things into. And that's not really a standard greenhouse size. It's a little bit too, um, too, too big to go into a standard greenhouse. So in September, we're launching a Kickstarter campaign and we're asking people to contribute to our project, partly so that we can shrink these things down and fit them into standard six-foot greenhouses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also partly to encourage people to put systems like this in with a bit of electronics that take the data and uh, push it into the cloud so that we can get a better picture of what the kind of conditions across the UK are. Uh, and again, come back to those questions about exactly how much food we can grow and how much it costs and so on. I guess two things, or two or three things, there must must come into play. I, how skilled you are as a grower, and um, as well as the setup and temperature the, of your particular area, and um, and how how skilled you are as a fish keeper as well. Do you find? I'm sure I'm going to find out the answer to those questions, and it may prove that I'm not very, <laughs> I'm not very skilled at all, but. Um. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, another thing that we can contribute to is to, be, is, put, is to build online communities where people can help each other and answer each other's questions and so on. You know, the, the wis it's a bit of a hackneyed phrase these days, but the wisdom of the crowds can really help individuals. When we can tap into a knowledge and experience that's distributed across lots of people, mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe we can make shortcuts and, you know, all become experts in a way. That would be great. You know, we have a, um, a forum attached to this sustainability show, which you're more than welcome right. to contribute to, and we'll certainly um, we'll keep up to date. Great. I'd love to do that. And, and I'll make a plug maybe for my website, which is uh, wegrow.social. Fantastic, uh, yes. If you go along there, we've got a little pitch video for the crowdfunding campaign, and you can uh, check out how we're getting on and where we're going and stuff. I definitely want to have that up there, Hamish, definitely. Great. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if you, how much time you've got left, but uh, it's been fantastic speaking to you. I am due on the school run in a minute or two. <laughs> have you got time to just tell us about your... Um, uh, you were inventing a, a drain system for your beds. Yeah, we've got... I haven't actually got one uh, that I can show you. Um, well, you can... You, yeah, they're sort of hidden away underneath the beds. But basically, 
one of the uh, expensive things in this kind of system is managing the water flow. So we want the uh, we want the water to go up and down, up and down, because that's a very efficient way of getting um, nutrients into plant roots. Mm -hmm. My apologies, should have found, turned my phone down earlier on. Um, industrial uh, water flow control stuff is very expensive, so each valve would maybe cost a couple of hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is um, we've made um, we've taken the air pressure pump, air pump from a blood pressure monitor, which mm -hmm. costs two pounds, and we've put a little piece of a bike bicycle tire inner tube inside um, a standard plumbing fitting. And we run the blood pressure air pump, and it squashes the bike inner tube like this. And it's a very, very cheap way of making a valve. And so instead of a couple of hundred pounds, that's about 15 pounds worth of materials. Um, and all the designs are open source. Anybody from Newcastle to Nairobi can join in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're about promoting the technology, not about trying to charge inflated prices for it. Um, and hopefully using this combination of uh, a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of reuse and recycling, we can really drive the costs for this type of system down. That would be great. And it would be very interesting to see, because um, Hamish and I went on a course recently with Charlie Price, who's planning to set up a, a big commercial unit. So it would be great to see how he gets on with that too. Definitely, yeah. And there's a couple of, uh, you know, there's a couple of good examples out there already. There's one in Scotland called Moffat Can, and there's Bio Aqua Farm near Bristol. There's the one at Humble by Nature where we were on the course, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's a that's a, a nice thing to do if you're thinking of uh, getting into this kind of growing technology. Pop along there and have a look. They're they're all really lovely places to visit. Yes, I certainly gained a great deal from the course we just went on with Charlie. He's a a big live wire and very enthusiastic about. Yeah, yeah, he's a real pleasure to listen to. He is, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hamish. I really appreciate your your time today, and, and hopefully, um, we'll we'll perhaps have you on again in a little while and see how you've got on with your your growing. That'd be great. Nice talking to you, Debbie. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Hey, so Tim, tell us, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Have you discovered anything new? Uh, I've just finished writing an article about how Chile has been giving solar energy away for free uh, hmm. and why that may not actually be as good a thing as it sounds. Um, I basically, because of the intermittent nature of solar energy, they have to build over capacity. Um, right. So basically, when they get a nice batch of sunlight, you know, a nice couple of weeks of sunlight, um, they end up with more energy than people would ordinarily be using. So in order to sort of get people to use it, they give it away. But the problem they've hit is that potential investors looking at investing in new solar farms are looking at the energy being given away for free, and they're thinking, well, there's no money in it. Um, so it's become sort of self-defeating. Uh, it's. I think there's a there is a wider problem with energy to do with either having to have it at low cost or give it away, because uh, it's similar in its way to what's going on with oil. Uh, so until recently, I mean, oil prices are back up around fifty dollars now, but they had crashed below thirty, mm. and it's actually destroyed a lot of the long-term future projects. Um, so basically everyone's cut back on capital spending. They're just trying to make money out of what they've already got. The problem then is in future there's going to be a shortage which will drive prices back up again. Uh, so you get this sort of yo-yo pattern of prices getting very volatile. Mm. Uh, now I think you know what Chile is showing is something that has potential for the wider renewables industry that it costs an awful lot of upfront investment to actually deploy renewables. And the expectation is that you'll recoup that investment by selling the energy that you generate later on. Uh, you know, so that's the business model that we all work on. I mean, kind of every enterprise you can think of, you put money up, up front, 
in the hope that you'll get a return on it later on. Yes. Uh, so I think the problem that Chile has discovered, which the rest of us may discover, is that if you put too much capacity in and you can't use it, then it actually undermines future investment. Um, yes, unless we have some sort of um, uh, built-in capacity to either store it or to use it when it's needed, like the sea ball type idea. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, that has to be built in. The other one that probably mitigates it is to going from a national grid to an international grid. Uh, so certainly plans are in place across Europe to have a European-wide grid. Uh, now, that has the benefits that instead of all of us trying to deploy all of the different renewables, it allows different countries to deploy what's good for them. So if you like, I mean, Britain would be really good for wind because we're on the edge of the Atlantic and it blows a lot down the western side of the country. Mm. Uh, I mean, we're certainly good for tidal energy if anyone would get their act together to deploy it. Because uh, just down the road from me, you've got the second highest tidal range in the world. Um, you know, so it makes absolute sense to use tidal power here. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, solar would be much better deployed in places like Spain, southern Italy, Greece, where you can guarantee more sunlight all the year round. Yes. Um, you know, so the problem at the moment is because we're not connected up, then sort of everyone's trying to deploy all of the different renewables, whether they're in a good place or not. Um, what we could move to with the international connections is more each different area focusing on what it's good at. Um, so Norway, I think, is leading the way, but they've got loads of sort of hydro power. Um, similarly, I think Iceland is the other country that's really self-sufficient in renewables, but they've got geothermal because mm. uh, they're sort of sat on top of the mid-Atlantic mid ridge, so they've got volcanoes bubbling up underneath them. So it makes absolutely no sense in Iceland to deploy solar panels because six months of the year it's dark. <laughs> On the other hand, deploying the hydropower there, uh, sorry, geothermal power there makes absolute sense. Mm. Uh, now, whether or not we can ever interconnect Iceland, I don't know because they're quite a long way out. Um, but certainly, can, I mean, Norway, I think, has interconnectors to Britain. We now have a connection to Ireland and there's a connection to France. So gradually, as those connections build up across, so that you start to inter internationalize, you get to a point where if one part of Europe is sort of overproducing energy, then it can be shipped to another part of Europe that's deficient. Mm. So, so kind of having that there balances out. My concern, I think, is that governments haven't really got their head around this. I mean, there's very much a let's leave it to the market approach to it. Mm. Um, now, I really don't think that's going to work. I, mean, I think it takes active government investment to make things like that happen. So, I mean, if you're going to go that big, it would do. I mean, it's mm. one thing to, or, or the other side of that, to have small village type setups whereby, you know, a local town renews in different ways but you're not going to have that advantage then but i yeah i mean that's developing anyway so i can see us getting to a point where there are effectively two energy systems where there's one that's a kind of local one that's almost about saving energy rather than generating it mm. um yes okay you may put a bit back into the grid but the real thing will be about saving the money that we currently have to pay for energy um you know, so essentially, if you could deploy some solar panels or a wind turbine, I mean, if you're lucky enough to live near water, you might be able to have a small hydro plant. Um, that deploying those either at a household or a community level becomes a way of saving the energy that you'd otherwise use from sort of coal or gas. Um, you know, so you cut back on that reliance on the national grid. Mm. Now, I think the problem with that is that in saving the cost, it undermines the maintenance of the grid itself. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, because if I'm not paying an electricity bill because I no longer pay for electricity because I'm generating my own, but if enough of us do that, then the national grid stops being able to invest in maintenance and sort of future development. So I think at that point, I mean, there is going to have to be, I mean, for starters, I think it's going to need to run on a not-for-profit basis because energy is too precious a thing to allow to go. 
and if it gets to the point that the costs are being impacted then you just cannot afford to pay shareholders back. Uh, you know, so that will happen one way or another anyway so the more of us that go off grid the harder it's going to be for the energy companies to make money so one way or another the profit center is going to go um, I, that raises the question as to whether we need governments to step in in order to take taxes off everybody in order to maintain the system um, you know, which is not something I think governments have sort of thought about doing for at least the last 40 years. Can't they it being very popular? I mean, at the moment, people see the national grid as something that they pay quite a lot of money for, mm. and um, they expect it to be there for them. The truth is, if, if some of us hadn't been generating energy for our own, they wouldn't have enough. No. But, um, but equally, uh, I can't see it being a particularly uh, vote-collecting um, <laughs> enterprise. Well, I mean, I think the problem is that nobody has a plan. You know, so essentially the plan is leave it to the market, the market will sort it all out. Because what the market is doing is saying, well, we don't like national grids, we like generating our own. Um, so the conversation I had with Chris a few weeks ago, I was saying that Sainsbury's are going off grid. Now, since then, I've come across three or four other different big national companies that are going off grid. Um, uh, they pay a significant part of the cost of the grid. Uh, there's a lot of the costs have fallen on big industry far more than it's fallen on households. Now, I mean, certainly there's scope. I mean, I was looking at the profits that each of the big six energy companies took last year. Mm. Uh, I think two of them, I think it was Eon and EDF, have actually seen their profits go through the floor. Uh, the others are still holding up profit, but not as much as they had been. Mm. Uh, but yes, I mean, four out of the six are making good money. So there is certainly room there that you could kind of cut the return to investors. Uh, the risk is the moment you cut the return to investors, the investors may go elsewhere. Um, yes, of course. Mm. You know, so it's not, I mean, it's not a straightforward thing. Um, you know, uh, the problem, I think, is that governments will leave it until it's a crisis before they do anything. Mm -hmm. Because the alternatives are actually unpopular, as you say. Mm. Um, you know, nobody wants their taxes to go up. On the other hand, I think if you realize that your taxes are going up specifically for the energy you use, there may be something, there's something in that. There's one of the problems we've had historically is we don't like tax cuts because we see politicians spending our taxes on duck houses and what have you, and moat cleaning. Uh, so as long as there's that feeling that, well, you're taking money off me, basically just to have a good life of your own and it's not benefiting me. Uh, you know, whereas I think if we move to a system where people can kind of see what their taxes are going on, you know, that could work. Um, I'm pretty sure people would be happy to pay taxes for things like the NHS. Uh, the problem has always been, well, how do we kind of cut that money off so it's in a pot of its own that we can all see where it's going? At the moment, there isn't a particular, there isn't, things aren't ring fenced either, or not very much. It no. all goes into a big pot and then they decide which direction it's going to, and it's, it's not that clear. Yeah, I mean, because the other way governments can tax you by stealth is just to print the money. <laughs> so essentially, when you print money, you remove a small, tiny, insy bit of the value out of everybody else's money. Uh, so you don't kind of notice it happening as much until you get inflation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think one way or another, we're moving to a position where if the state doesn't step in, nobody else is going to. Because um, I was looking at a device somebody's built, I mean, it's in the States, but I'm trying to find out whether there's anything equivalent here, where the guy has made portable solar panels that link in with a battery and an inverter. Uh, and basically what you do is put it out in the sun while the sun's shining, charge the batteries up on it, then it's either an emergency source of mains power or an additional source of mains power. Um, I mean, he was claiming that the battery life is such that you can run sort of household utilities on it. Uh, whether or not it would do a full wash on a washing machine, I'm not sure, but it will certainly power your computer for a while. Um, the military have got um, big portable cabins, and they? they can tow them hmm. around and then open, they all open out. And great big solar arrays with with mm. uh, quite um, extensive things inside they're using for education and hospitals and all kinds of things. 
Yeah, I mean, certainly I think you know, even at the small scale this guy was doing, he had a panel about the size of a medium-sized suitcase. Oh, right. So um, a little thing then. Yeah, I mean, only a couple of inches thick, but he had two big lithium, say lithium ion batteries. Uh, yeah, I mean, a few circuit boards for the various things that you needed to step up the voltage and uh, yeah, and I think some fuses in there just to stop it blowing up <laughs> when you get too much sunlight. Um, yeah, but I mean, essentially, you had a portable, so if you were going camping, it would be an ideal thing. It would mm. sort of provide you with power you know, right through the evening. Or um, I think he, somebody that he was talking about had used one on a boat. Um, you know, so basically while you're out on your boat, you point the thing into the sun and generate some electricity while you're out there. Then if you need to boil the kettle or whatever, you're doing it off that. Um, you know, and I mean, the useful thing with something like that is once you've paid the initial outlay on the panel, then it's saving you money on the energy that you generate, you know, because it's yours, not the national grids. Um, you know, so it could be, you know, I mean, I could see it as potential for people to use just as a way of cutting back their bills. Certainly, because I lived on a boat for quite a while, and um, uh, you have to supply all your own power there, really, unless you ha are on a permanent mooring. Which, hmm. And on a narrow boat, obviously, you have a, a greater potential because you've got a big, car, um, big uh, roof space. You know, hmm. Assuming, you know, well, depending on what size boat you've got, of course, but you but could potentially have anything up to 70 foot length mm. and you know, seven to 10 foot wide or, or even 14 foot wide if you've got a big one. Um, mm. You've got a big roof space on which you can put um, solar mm. panels. And quite a few people do, at least to top up your batteries because your whole electricity is being run off of a battery power. It's most mm. 12 volt, including fridges and, and, and lighting and any music you want to, to play. Mm. All has to be 12 volt, really. Or though you can put inverters in, just uh, run them up a bit higher. But mm. um, So you're either doing that or you're running your engine or a generator to, mm. to provide that electricity. And, of course, uh, particularly since most of us are out during the day working, if, if it's trickling that power into your batteries all day, mm. then and you've got a, a bit when you come home when you need some light and that when it goes a bit darker. Yeah, I mean, I can see that, you know, as I say, it can't be long, um, given that I've already come across somebody in the States that's selling that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to be long before somebody in this country does the same thing. And as I say, anyone that's dealing with a low income, I mean, if you get hold of something like that, which didn't look too difficult to make. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the point is, it's standalone. So it's not something that you have to feed back into the grid or anything. It's just a way of powering things around the house without the need to plug into the grid. Mm, mm. You know, so if you're starting to think that energy bills are going up a bit, I mean, it might be that you invest in one of these things and then save the money off your bill every quarter. Mm, mm. Uh, just the downside in the long term is that the energy companies are likely to put their prices up to compensate. Well, that's a possibility unless you're uh, because you know to become completely self-sufficient is mm. quite tough. Yeah, but it becomes. I mean, this is the point: is you get into this. I mean, it's been called a death spiral. Uh, so essentially, in order for them to keep everything going, they've got to put the price up. But the more they put the price up, the more we're inclined to go off grid. So mm. either you get millions of people at the bottom of the pile that just can't afford it anymore. Uh, you know, so essentially, you have people now that have the choice between food and heat. Um, you know, so, okay, they're taking themselves out at the bottom. Then people that have money start to take themselves off grid in one way or another. Uh, so that gradually the cost of running the grid has to fall onto a, a shrinking group of people in the middle. Mm. Uh, I think, I mean, it will never get to the point that the grid crashes that way just because it will become politically unacceptable. Um, you know, I mean, even at the prices that they're charging at the moment, people are dissatisfied with them. Uh, you know, because it always seems to be, well, when the price of energy comes down, it takes them ages to pass the price cuts to us. But as soon as the prices go up again, our bills go up immediately. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, so all of us are wise to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, essentially, that's allowing these companies at the moment to pay investors far more than you'd get as a return on investment anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think those days are numbered. Um, but as I say, I'm not convinced that what comes next, if there's no plan behind it, is actually going to work. 
it's a bit tough, isn't it? Um, but on, on the other hand, I still think we should, in the West in particular, be considering um, more sustainable energy from any form, really, because, you know, there isn't that much oil to go around and we're going to need it longer term if we can spread it further by not using it now. It's got to be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the other stories that I picked up this week. As I mean, people may be aware that Saudi Arabia has been has put this plan to go renewable. Um, now, why they're doing it is not a sudden concern for the environment or anything else. What it's about is maintaining their oil exports. Mm. That's what they're looking at. I mean, they're aware that they're, you know, the big Saudi oil fields have already peaked. Um, so they've been drilling into the seabed in the... Persian Gulf. Now you don't go and do that if there's plenty of oil on land. Mm. Um, now what they're looking at, I mean, actually the Saudi government has said that sometime in the mid 2020s they won't be able to export anymore. You know, basically what they're getting out of the ground will be powering their economy. So why they've gone to this plan to go for renewables, I mean, part of it is they're ideally placed to do solar farms. Um, you, know, you can't get any better than a desert. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, you know, so they're well placed. So what they're looking at doing is weaning as much of their economy as they can off oil and gas so that they can then sell what they've got left to the world market. Now, interestingly, the other country that's just come out doing the same thing is Norway. Mm. Um, now they're fortunate. They have a smaller population than we do. So they've got, they had about 50% of the North Sea oil and gas. Um, whereas we are now a net importer of oil and gas, Norway is still able to export just because it's got the smaller population. Mm. But again, what Norway is aiming to do is go renewable in order to maximize the amount of oil and gas that they can sell abroad. Mm. Uh, I, in the end, it became, all it's doing is putting off a problem for another decade. Um, you know, so there is going to come a time where basically they're not going to be able to supply the world market. Um, so one way or another, sooner or later, we are all going to have to wean ourselves off oil and gas. Uh, the question, in a way, again, is back to how we do it. You know, are we going to do it in a planned way? Because <laughs> uh, there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of wiggle room in this. You know, I mean, but if you insulate your house, you don't need to have the central heating on full blast. You know, put a sweater on in the evening, and you can turn the thermostat down two degrees. You know, so. I don't see a lot of that going on. That's that's the bit that kind of scares me. I think because um, mm. you know the, the big supermarkets have converted more and more and more of their space over to um, microwave meals mm. or instant dinners. And and when we had the uh, energy shortage created by the lorry um, holdups last summer, I think it was, mm. uh, you know, people panicked because they really generally didn't have anything to eat. And, and so, and our lives are so busy now, and I see more and more of that, people mm. relying on the um, just as we need it facility of just getting what you need when you need it, not, not containing a lot of stuff yourself, because then you don't need as much room at home either. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I always think it's a bit like when you were a kid and your mother used to say, well, you've got two choices here. You, know, you can tidy your room yourself or I'll come and do it. And if I do it, you're not going to like it. <laughs> uh, essentially, we have an energy predicament that we could at this stage plan out, well, how are we going to do this? And I mean, the single most energy efficient thing you can do is to learn to stop using it. Mm. Um, but it's, it's difficult. I mean, we've all got used to the comfort of, you know, if I need something around the shop, I'll just pop in the car. You know, the idea that you would walk to the shops. <laughs> yeah, and it's more convenient to go to the supermarket where you can get it all in one place than it is to go to the local shops. So mm. do that. Yeah, so. I think also because when it's that readily available, because that's the other thing I can remember quite clearly about when I moved on to the boat. Mm. But the very first thing, the first few days, I used water as I'd always been using water. And it, mm. it, I didn't even think that I was that um, um, overusing because I didn't have a washing machine on, on the boat. And I, didn't ha I did have a shower. And mm. It was hot. And um, obviously we were washing up for, for cooking and what have you. Mm. But my goodness, when you've got, when you've got, a, you've got a specific... Uh, 500 litre tank and you use it in three days you think wow my goodness I mean by the time I left the boat six years later I could make that last all week mm. but um, and more 
But um, when I first moved on, that was two or three days worth. So the fact that you turn the tap on and it's readily available there all the time. And the same, we come in, we can flick a light on, we can pick up, put our computers on, we can get in the car and go and do. Um, the fact that it is as convenient and as available means that we don't think about it as much. Well, but its availability was based on cheap energy and particularly cheap oil. Mm. Uh, you know, this is the problem. Uh, the issue isn't that anyone's going to run out of oil in that sense. There'll always be more oil under the ground than we've ever got out of the ground. The problem is that we've used all of the cheap stuff and we're moving on to the more expensive stuff. Mm. And it's knock on for everything else is that everything else costs more. Mm. Uh, so if you look at the water system, we have a water system that is largest taken to extremes because we've actually every drop of water has to be drinking water quality and yet we drink very little of it. <laughs> mm. If you think about it, you don't need drinking quality water to flush the toilet, to shower in, to wash your clothes in. You know, actually, as long as you've taken the kind of big impurities out of the water, anything else is fine. Because the only concern with those activities is discoloration. Um, you know, it's no more harmful for you to drink in water that's just been filtered than it is to jump in the sea or jump into a river, <laughs> mm. you know, which are things that a lot of us have done at some time or another. Mm. So yeah. it's, it's almost one of these things, you know, if you wanted to get where you need to be, you wouldn't start from here. You know, that we wouldn't have a national water system where every drop of water mm. is purified to drinking standards. You know, probably we'd have bottled water for drinking and just cleaned water for everything else. Um, mm. You know, so, I mean, there are a lot of problems in the system we've inherited that's one way or another we're going to have to iron our way through. Yes, I, one of the parts when I, we were on the aquaponics course recently is obviously that all has to be organic. You can't start putting chemicals in of any kind because if you start putting in things to cure, you know, fungus, fungus on the fish, for instance, because you haven't got your fish balance right, then you're going to kill off, you know, the, the um, nitrogen trifying bacteria that are creating the nitrogen for your plants and equally you can't start spraying your plants with insecticides otherwise you're going to kill your fish so the, the whole system is quite I mean um, uh, uh, it needs to be contained in a way mm. to stop a lot of the things entering into the system in the first place but mm. also you need to be able to keep everything um, carefully balanced so that the fish mm. Um, it's high enough numbers of them to create enough food to create the food and and and, and I think that's that's probably what we that, that knowledge base is a bit thin people don't know much about that at the moment hmm. and, and it is quite um, intensive for um, what which the stuff we learned obviously we, we're doing it in a very short period of time but but um, and that's just fish and plants. I mean, there are worm versions. You know, people do use worm tea instead of fish to create the, the uh, um, nitrogen. Or people use, um, uh, there are setups where people use human waste to create the mm. nitrogen. Although you might want to break the system so it goes out via something else before it, mm. or the water comes back through. So it's it created the nitrogen elsewhere, so you're not... not um, yeah potentially drinking something that you once used nobody's going to or nobody's going to enjoy that very much <clears throat> but in that in that system there was quite a few options to add in and, and certainly on the course we were on the um the add-ons add like the um black soldier flies and the quails and things were, were quite an important part and the worms in the media were quite an important mm. part of making that a really full-on sustainable setup where you've got a very large um, um, what I'm trying to say a, a large quantity of food you, you had you had other things that you could bring in to play yeah yeah, I mean, I think part of where we're moving to is a much greater aware awareness on the various inputs into the things that we have now. Mm. Uh, whereas you say, I mean, people can take for granted a microwave meal. You know, but then you think of the kind of inputs that you have to have to enable you to do that. Because uh, essentially you need kind of mass consumption, mass production to do it. Uh, I mean, you've got huge en energy inputs, you've got huge water inputs, and actually a lot of it wasted when you do that. 
Mm. So essentially, it's only by doing it on a large scale that you can afford the waste. Because if you like, all of the waste gets kind of costed in as a tiny percentage of everybody. Uh, so it only works on a mass consumption level. So if that starts to break down and you're then faced with a generation that don't know how to grow and cook food, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's going to be a culture shock. Mm. Um, I can certainly see a kind of trend towards having to certainly cook your own. Um, there's once the true costs of actually doing mass production start to hit home, which is actually a factor of increasingly expensive energy. Mm. Um, I mean, the process is difficult because you get volatility. So if you like what we've seen in oil in the last certainly decade now, of that basically you get a supply problem where there isn't enough supply to meet demand, that causes the price to shoot way up. So I think at one point we had oil prices at around $140 a barrel. Yes. Mm. Now, when the prices go that high for more than a few months, you start getting investment in oil patches that nobody would have gone anywhere near. So suddenly things like hydraulic fracturing become viable. Mm. You kind of think, right, $140 a barrel, we can afford to drill that stuff, do the fracking, and still make money on the sales. Mm. Is the problem is when you do that, part of it is that at $140 you kill demand because people aren't able to afford the fuel, they're not able to afford the transport costs and everything else. Mm. So sufficient numbers of people start cutting back to the point that the price falls again. The result when the price falls is it doesn't just fall down to where it would be sort of break even, it falls through the floor. Mm. You know, so you get this kind of wave pattern of kind of peaks and troughs. What it's doing is destroying long-term investment. Um, so the problem is that at each turn, the supply problem when it hits is always worse. Mm. Uh, so that's what we're going into. And it's a factor of the energy that we're producing being more expensive. Mm. Uh, so forget the price, look at the cost. Uh, you know, once you do that... Yeah, it isn't because it knocks on into everything. So everything gets more expensive. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, somebody from the road, road haulage industry, whether it was last year or a while back, was pointing out basically anything that's in your house at some time in its life came on a lorry uh, you know, or in a van. <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah. Yeah, so basically if the price of petrol and diesel is going up, then the price of all of the stuff in your house is going up. Um, you know, now, initially, you might not notice it, and it might just be that few pence on everything as the months go by. But our ability to pay for it isn't going up. No, that's the, that's the big drive with, with governments keep saying now, don't they? Grow, grow, grow. The economy mm. needs to grow. Everything needs to grow. But that's obviously <laughs> that, that demand that we have the resources to make everything grow. And, of course, mm. that is not necessarily a great thing, particularly if, as the West has the, the, the biggest um, claim on those resources and some bits of the world are getting worse and worse and worse off and we don't even notice it. Yeah, I mean, the growth, well, I mean, essentially, we grew, I mean, back in the 18th century on the back of coal, because uh, mm. coal was a hugely powerful energy source. I, prior to that, the best you had was small amounts of charcoal. Mm. Um, I mean, timber was you know, what most people use both for building and for burning. Uh, one of the results in Elizabethan Europe was we chopped down all the trees. One of the big motivators for Europeans going to the United States or to America as it was then was the huge timber resources they had there. Mm -hmm. um, I, basically the reason why the British were able to beat the Spanish Armada and all of that was on the back of American timber. Because mm -hmm. you know, we could build ships, the Dutch built ships. So you had all of those naval wars between Britain and Holland in the 17th century. And eventually the timber in America allowed Britain to build a wooden navy that was big enough to build its empire. Um, yeah, the industrial wave then on the back of that trade came in the form of steam power because we, we were forced to move on to coal. You know, essentially the wood had gone, so what else can you use? You go to Colebrookdale where they built the first iron bridge in Shropshire. Yeah. 
Mm. Uh, and there were lumps of coal sort of sticking out of the side of the hill. You, know, you didn't have to work very hard to get it. You just went and knocked a piece off. And you know, that was the equivalent of several trees worth of energy. Um, yes. Yeah, of course, once we used the easy stuff, then you had to start digging pit mines. And eventually you kind of had to dig through the seams. And you know, at each stage, you needed more energy input in order to get energy out, which is why, in the end, the British economy collapsed. You know, the American economy, on the other hand, with all of that oil underneath the ground, oil being a much denser source of energy, the Americans were able to expand. So essentially, we had all of that cheap energy, and it's allowed us to build the system that we have today. And being typical humans, we blamed it all on ourselves. So it was our ingenuity that did it. You know, it's something mm -hmm. in the British character. It wasn't. It was energy. <laughs> Now the yeah. problem is you whip the cheap energy out and substitute expensive energy instead and then you're faced with all of these problems that we're starting to see today that you're know, actually there isn't going to be enough to go around <laughs> uh yeah it's, it's things that work on a global scale basically have allowed us to do all of that stuff because we've had the cheap energy to do it so yeah we, so we built complexity where what we need is simplicity um so I think one way or another, we're going to have to relearn that simplicity. I, mean, it, I think my grandparents' generation had it to a degree, uh, you know, that people were able to do much more locally than we'd become used to. But it's a different way of life. I'm not sure anybody wants to go there. That's the problem, isn't it? Because, I mean, I've done it. I've been there. I did, I did run it. And it is a very much different. It is a very different way of life. When my children were small, I was lucky enough to be living... In a, in a farm cottage with a great big acre garden and I grew practically everything we ate. But it was 24-7 to keep it up to do, um, to grow that size space by hand. It was you know, all hand dug and um, to make all our own clothing. And we had a, um, a range where I could um, utilize, um, that was an oil burn actually. But, so that that wasn't, that wasn't self-sufficient bit, but the food and clothing I did myself. Um, but then I wasn't at work either, and I have to say, as soon as I went back to work, as the children hit school age, <laughs> I had a much easier life, physically. We did eat like kings, we did have an incredibly healthy life, and it was fun in some ways, but it's also quite demanding, and I mm. have to come through for, with agricultural training, so I knew how to grow things. So that was my contribution, in a way, to the family household, when my, my income had stopped in order to bring up the children. But um, that's certainly not everybody's love. No, but not everybody loves to grow things. And I still grow far more than I need, actually, but still. But that's just because I happen to like doing that. Yeah, I, mean, I think there are, you know, there's a lot of difficulty trying to predict where this goes. Yes. Uh, I, think I'm, I tend to come across two groups of people. I mean, there's one group of people that think it's the end of the world. That yeah, it's yeah, apparently we're about to face something similar to what the dinosaurs faced when the comet fell on them. Mm. Um, the other side of it is a complete denial that there's a problem, and just yeah, you know, basically through something to do with algorithms and mobile phones that will save the day. Mm. Uh, I, both of those positions to me are delusional. I agree, but I, I do think we all ought to be doing a little bit, and, and if we all did a little bit, then then. Uh, I don't suppose we'd fend off the problems altogether, but they'd certainly take a lot longer to come about, which would give us room for development of these other alternatives, which at the moment yeah. well, I think isn't happening very well. Uh, the economics are where it will play out. Yes. Um, uh, to a degree, I mean, at the moment we're in this respite because people have had cheap energy. Um, yeah, I, one of the things I observe, I don't drive at the moment, but so I noticed that petrol prices went down to below a pound a litre not yeah. that long ago. Mm. Uh, now, it makes a huge difference, a huge difference. Oh, absolutely. No, stupidly, I think there's quite a sizable number of people have gone out and bought big cars, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which again is part of that delusion that, you know, <laughs> okay, pound a litre, I can afford to have a big SUV. Uh, anyone with any sense at this stage in the game, if you have to drive, should be going for energy efficient cars. Um, but it's you know, part of the herd mentality, I guess, that prices go down and we all assume they'll stay down. What we're starting to see now is prices creeping back up. 
Uh, there are, I think the IMF has predicted prices going up above $200 a barrel. So that's four times the price that it is now. There are some economists that are pointing to $300 a barrel. Uh, I mean, this you're looking at by 2020, I think, for $300. Uh, now, the, comparatively, that would be the equivalent of a liter of petrol going up to about three quid. Um, now, question there is, well, how many of us could afford to carry on living the life we're living now at three pounds a liter? Uh, I think what you'll start to see is people just opting out. Um, I mean, we're reasonably lucky here. I mean, the commuting into Cardiff tends to be fairly local. So you're talking about people traveling sort of 20 or 30 miles. I observe with London that people commute from here. Um, now the point is you do that because the job that you have in London is much higher paid than the job you have here, but the housing here is much less to buy than it is in London. So kind of London is able to keep going on the basis of huge volumes of people commuting in. Once you start to price oil out of people's range, so you, you can no longer afford the car. Well, don't try getting on public transport because that's already like playing sardines. Uh, you know, so you can't suddenly have people leave the cars behind in any numbers with a view to using public transport because the infrastructure won't support it. No, what will happen, of course, is the price is high house prices in London will hike. Yeah, I mean, you'll be... you price everybody out that currently mm. lives there that's that's not on a very, very good wage. Yeah, I mean, it becomes quite serious for London, I think, because the lowest paid workers are the ones that are likely to opt out of the system first. Of course they will, because they won't be able to maintain it. Mm. Yeah, so suddenly other cities around the country become much more desirable because it's cheaper to live there. So even if you end up taking a lower paid job, you're going to be better off taking the low paid job and not having to drive. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, public transport crashes partly because they've got the same high, rising fuel price issues. Uh, but also any additional demand means that they've got to put prices up in order to deter people from using them. Um, yeah. you know, so my, my sort of issue, though, is, you know, we, we know these problems, or some of us at least, have recognised that problems are there, but how are we going to make our own lives a little bit more resilient so that we can cope with those different things that are coming along? What can we do individually? It's quite, it's, you know, not every, now a lot of people are in flats who don't even have a garden, they can't mm. grow stuff, which is one option. We don't necessarily have the the rights over the whole of the building so it's difficult to put solar or wind power up um, <clears throat> unless you are lucky enough to live in uh, um, an individual property and and so that's food and energy and, and what about you know the other things that we're going to need water where's that going to come from if the energy runs out and the water becomes much, either much higher priced or more difficult to get well but then you know i mean sustainability is about it's more than us being each individually self-sustaining, you know, sort of any more than we are now. That, so essentially we all have to learn ways of doing things that are tradable. Uh, I think that's the issue, isn't it? It's not just to be able to do the self-sufficiency bit, hmm. but to be able to produce more than we need so that we can trade it with other... other. Yeah, I mean, some people are going to grow, grow food. Um, you know, I, at what scale, who knows? I and mean, that's the problem we're trying to predict this. I mean, my own bet is for an agricultural system similar to what we had sometime in the 60s or 70s. So it would be an intermediate grade where there's some energy, you know, so you'll still be able to operate one of the, if you remember the old milk impalers that they used to have, where you had the suction pumps, but the farmer had to sort of walk around in the well actually doing everything. <laughs> I can imagine something like that operating. So what you're not going to have is these big things where the cow is on a conveyor belt and is picked up and taken in automatically without human contact at all, because that's incredibly energy inefficient. On the other hand, it's the only way that farmers have been able to sustain their, their well, livelihoods of, of more recent years, because I can remember when I came out of, well, I trained, when I started to train in agriculture, which was only in the 80s, um, hmm. At the average herd size was about 80 animals and one person could quite easily manage that number. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. by the time I came out, they, they didn't exist because they just couldn't make enough out of it because they were producing milk that would go off in a truck to wherever and, mm. and the cost of the labour to produce it and the, the, the cost of owning and feeding and looking after the animals. <clears throat> Even though they were still outside a good proportion of the year, they only brought in when it was too cold or too wet, so they'd poached the ground so heavily that it, it was more sensible to bring them in. Hmm. Um, but those sorts of small dairy units are almost non-existent now. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the question becomes, is it possible to get back to that? Because I, one of the things that will happen again, I mean, we're seeing it with demand destruction in transport. That at the moment, it is so cheap to charter a ship that all of the East African pilot, pirates have gone out of business. <laughs> um, you know, so basically, okay, nobody is investing in shipbuilding. Uh, so I don't know what the time lag is on a ship, you know, maybe a decade or so. But so basically, as the current fleet is retired, there isn't a replacement fleet to come and take its place. Mm. Yeah, so again, it's another example of this problem that if the money isn't there today, then people don't invest in the future. But one of the things that tells me is that global transport costs are going to go through the roof at some point. You know, so essentially all of that kind of competition with selling your powdered milk to China, you know, that's suddenly not going to work because the transportation costs are going to make it unprofitable. Now, when that happens, I think the big agricultural systems that we've developed are going to go away. Now, the question is, can we then downscale? So as the economy relocalizes, now, that will either be at a European level, possibly a national level. But I think we will lose a lot of that ability to be global. I, I have my doubts on that, I just, I, because it demands a certain amount of skill too. And although... We've, we've mechanized very much um, a lot of agriculture so that, you know, a few people can do it uh, or a few people can run a very large number of acres. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only will the fuel price make that difficult, but, but if you start to run out and don't have that option, mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of who's going to do it then because the skill base is gone. I mean, I can remember when I, I was training, there was eight people on my course. Mm -hmm. And the college stopped doing the training courses at the end of our year because there just wasn't enough people wanting to learn it. Hmm. The, the, the idea of going to learn agriculture was, was sort of, you know, uh, even, even my partner at the time says, well, everybody else trains not to have to do it because it's hmm. too much like hard work. We want to sit in an office and do a nice cushy job. Thank you very much. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with, I mean, if you like, for the last 50 years at least, we've pursued complexity in order to have efficiency. Yes. So essentially we've created more and more specialist divisions of labor. So there are fewer people doing the things they're doing, but what they're doing is incredibly complex. Um, and you see it in every field that we've got, that there are more specialities in the economy now than there've ever been. And the problem is that we need to kind of, in the process of decoupling all of that, that we may not be able to get back anywhere. You know, so essentially in future, you've got the kind of conditions that allowed us to do that complexity are being taken away, but we don't know how to decouple the complexity. Yes, it's very difficult. Anyway, um, Tim, uh, our time is up and yeah. um, the next sustainability program is, is due shortly. So we need to wrap up uh, now and yeah. um, looking forward to, uh, hoping to be able to, uh, I've been, speaking to a few people in, in different uh, areas and hoping to be able to get them on board to come and speak with us in a couple of weeks' time. And, mm. um, yeah, great to talk to you, Tim. Okay, well, let's do it again in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Lovely. By which time I will be thoroughly fed up of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> more than likely, more than likely. Yeah. <laughs>